very much, uh, David. It's great to be uh, great to be here, and you're certainly the soul of discretion, and you have to be on I appreciate your introduction, and, uh, and I appreciate your friendship, and it's uh, it's wonderful to uh, to be uh, among so many friends. And yes. I, I come from a different tradition, so uh, there's a Randy Newman song that says it feels like home to me, and I felt that way uh, since 2006, and I'm very, I'm very glad to be home and very glad to be here with all of you tonight. Uh, so, uh, and it's uh, it's hard to single people out in the room. There are so many uh, friends and uh, people that I've worked with, and people who are my colleagues, and people who are my uh, my mentors and people who have tolerated me while I have strayed and uh, allowed me to come back. Uh, no, I'm not referring to my wife, I guess. I'm uh, speaking politically that I've strayed. I'm not referring to any other, uh, any other metaphors. But I, I, uh, I'm really glad to, uh, to be here tonight. This is actually the third time that I've spoken to the uh, Walter Gordon Circle. Uh, I spoke here right after. The, uh, the defeat of the Ray government in 1995-96, uh, and uh, I spoke here uh, soon after Michael Ignatius became the leader of the party, uh, and I'm delighted to be here uh, tonight uh, as well. Uh, let me also say that, uh, you know, it's a funny, funny sort of life that I've led because uh, Mr. Gordon was uh, like to a lot of people in this room, uh, a very powerful uh, influence and mentor. And Graham Murray is here tonight. Graham is a, a bit of a sort of a historian of uh, political events. And I can tell you that uh, when I ran uh, for Parliament in 1978, in a by-election, after I had been successful, and I, 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 I worked with Charles Katcha in 1968, I, I, uh, in Davenport riding, which was Walter's former riding, that's where I first got to know him because I was a, a canvas organizer and camp council was the campaign manager and I was the, the number two person and we were trying to encourage Charles to do a lot of the uh, bamboozling events that you do in an election campaign and Charles catches, anyone who knows Charles would know had nothing to do with any of that stuff. Uh, and uh, Mr. Gordon was there as sort of trying to encourage Charles to kind of ease up a bit and do some of the stuff that you have to do as a candidate. Uh, so when I ran in 1978 as a New Democrat, uh, the, the day after the campaign started, a check arrived in the mail for me for $250, which at that time was a fair contribution uh, made up to the Bob Ray New Democratic Party campaign and it was signed by Walter Gordon. And I phoned up Mr. Gordon and I said, Walter, you understand that if you give more than $99 under our extraordinarily puritanical rules, which we have in Canada, uh, like previous, previous eras, uh, I said, you know, your name will appear on the list. I can't, you know, you have to give less than $100. And he said, he said, Bobby, used to call me. He said, Bobby, don't you understand? I want my name to be on the list. That's why I'm giving you the 200 <laughs> uh, And until he died, Mr. Gordon was my first supporter, uh, for which I have always been extremely uh, uh, grateful. Uh, so uh, it was uh, uh, when I came back to the, the fold and ran for the leadership of the party in 2006, uh, I, I had that memory uh, very much in, uh, in, uh, in mind. And of course, I'm something of a historian of the Liberal Party, and I'm going to refer to some of those things tonight. Uh, but uh, I, I do want to give this group a, a bit of a report uh, on my first year as the interim leader. Uh, and I, I just want, in case you, anyone wants to ask a smart question, stand up and say, what are you going to do? Let me just say, I have to say this in the presence of Arlene. Uh, I don't know what the executive is going to decide next. But apparently, the, the CBC knows. <laughs> but uh, I don't know what the executive is going to decide. And there are a couple of members of the executive who are here. 
uh, and I don't know because my experience in life is never predict the outcome of a cabinet meeting, never predict the outcome of a caucus meeting, and I never predict the outcome of an executive meeting. And I've learned somewhat at my peril to make that, to, to have reached that conclusion. And second of all, I, I can tell you that until it's decided, nothing is decided. So I just think we have to wait and see what happens. Uh, but I do want to give you a sense of a couple of things that I've concluded as a result of my uh, time as interim leader. Uh, the first thing I want to say to everyone here is that, um, I, as I've said before with respect to my becoming Premier, I always wanted to be leader of the Liberal Party in the worst way. Uh, and uh, I actually got my wish. <laughs> I can tell you that uh, when I phoned Michael Ignatieff, who as you know is, is a, uh, a good friend, and we, I phoned him on the morning of May the 3rd to commiserate because I knew how, how hard the, the last 10 days of the campaign had been, and I, I knew how hard he would take the result on the night of May the 2nd, and he of course started commiserating and saying how awful it was. I said, what are you complaining about? I said, you lost. I won. <laughs> you're going to go off and do whatever you're going to do. You're going to find what many people who lose elections find, that they get to take the summer off, they get to reflect on life, they uh, then get to move on to other things. And of course, those who are left behind are, are uh, back in the House of Commons and doing our thing. And, and it, was, it was very tough. Uh, for the caucus, uh, to come back into a house, and ironically, I mean, it was it was really there was this, all these huge ironies. When I was first elected in 1978 in the House of Commons, I sat in the last row in the corner on the bottom left-hand side of the House of Commons, as you're looking from the speaker's chair, and after. You know, 35 years of public service and political life and ups and downs, I find myself in the front row, in the <laughs> right hand of this corner, back in the very tight corner where we are. But I can tell you, for me, it was like, okay, I'm back being leader of the third party. I've done this before. Uh, I know what it's like to lead the third party. I know what it's like to have to, to, to make the kinds of decisions you have to make as a third party. You've got a small staff, you've got a small group. You've got a small research team, you've got a small, energetic, committed group of people, and you have to be like uh, Sir Francis Drake, you have to be fast and nimble, you have to respond quickly, you have to get around the country, you don't have any staff. Remember the first trip I took to Halifax, uh, I, uh, I arrived and somebody said, well, where's your staff? Where's the other people? I said, there is no staff, there's me, I'm here. So let's get in the car and let's go. So we went. And I think people were kind of saying, well, well this is, you know, this is terrible. This is unbelievable. And yes, it's terrible. If you look historically at what happened, it was the worst defeat for the Liberal Party since the first responsible, accountable elections uh, in the 1840s in Ontario and Quebec. We've never had a defeat like this. And, you know, you look back in time, there will never have been a moment. You know, maybe there's a brief comparison with Laurier in 1917 when, he, when the caucus was completely split, the government was completely split. But actually, no, Laurier was in second place. Laurier was still the opposition to the Union government, even though half his liberal colleagues were across the way in the board's cabinet. Which is, when you think about it, almost unbelievable. But still, for us, this has been a very, very tough defeat. And of course, there are going to be the pundits who will say that it's the end of the Liberal Party, that it's George Dangerfield, the death of Liberal England, and, and yada, 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 the Liberals have gone this way, and that's, that's the end. And I, I want to just refer to that very briefly, because I think it's very important psychologically for the party to understand what's taken place. And for us to understand that we're in the middle of history, so we're not quite sure what's going to unfold. But to say that the future is not fixed. And in a sense, it's partly up to us as to what happens. That yes, there are very few examples in history, in modern political history, 
There are very few examples of a political party having been whacked back successively and as far back as we were, and then managed to completely recover and transform once again the political agenda of the country uh, and become once again a majority party. There are very few other examples of how this has taken place. So I don't think any one of us should underestimate uh, how tough the challenge is or how serious the defeat was on May the 2nd. Because May the 2nd was not just one event. It was the culmination of a series of events that have happened that I think we have to understand. And, you know, I'm being very candid with this group here. I mean, I'm here at the heartland of liberal history and activism uh, in Ontario and for much of the country. There are people here who were present uh, during the years of the, of the Pearson government. And there were people here who were present during the time of the defeat of the Pearson, uh, of the Liberal Party in, 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 in 1958. But what we faced on May the 2nd is worse than 1958. Everybody has to understand that. People say to me, oh, this is like 84, it's like 58, it's the same thing. All we have to do is sit around, and we just sit around and do our work, do our homework, and pull ourselves together, we're back. Folks, the world has changed. It is not the same. We're not in second place, we're not the natural opposition, we're in third place. And we have to, almost in a psychological sense, embrace that, that event and understand what it means. We also have to understand that it's not the end of the world. That, as I've said to my colleagues almost every week in caucus, and David can, can verify this, uh, it's a terrible thing to lose. It's also, a, it's an even worse thing to think that defeat is permanent. Defeat is never permanent. The only times defeat is permanent is when the people who are on the receiving end of the defeat say, it's over. And I can give you countless historical examples of how it is that people have taken a defeat and said, well, that was bad, now where do I go? Like many of you, I've been reading this biography of Sir John A. And let's not forget that when the Liberals defeated Sir John A. in 1874, he was done. He was a crook. He was a drunk. He was corrupt. He was too old. He was done. Done like dinner. <laughs> and the Liberals defeated McDonald, and it was over. The whole experience of McDonald from 1857 to 1874, 17 years of great success, the great bamboozler, the guy who pulled the country together, the guy who fixed it all, and suddenly he was found with his hand in the till, send me another 10,000, and he was thrown out on his ear by the Canadian public. They were horrified at what had happened, and of course they brought in a an earnest, hard-working, honest, ethical, determined Liberal Party, and we were thrown out on our ear four years later by this corrupt, old, <laughs> defeated bamboozler. Why did that happen? Well, first of all, because there was a recession, and I know something about that. I, thought I, had to I didn't know how, how, how warmly I felt towards Alexander Mackenzie. You know, the one the first leader of our party after Confederation, who nobody really knows anything about. He was a hardworking, straight guy, and the day after he was defeated, Mackenzie wrote a letter to his to his caucus and his supporters, and he said, "I guess you have to be a corrupt chiseler." or a municipal graft receiver to become the Prime Minister of this country. He was pissed off. He was cheesed off. <laughs> but let me tell you something. And there are so many examples in history where it really is a function of are we prepared to accept this verdict as being a permanent verdict? Or 
are we prepared to say, okay, we're flat on our back. We're down, but as long as we're breathing, we're not out. And that, I think, is very, very important for us as a party to understand. The first mistake we make is the mistake of complacency. And I can't tell you the number of liberals who say to me, don't worry, it'll just come back. You know, we did it before, we'll do it again. You sort of say, well, you know, not exactly. Not just because you're sitting there telling me this. And it doesn't just happen on its own. And I have to tell you, very directly, <clears throat> in the presence of Mr. Crawley and Mr. McCain from the party, that our party organizationally, after a year, is in better shape than it was a year ago. We're better organized. We have more members, we have more supporters, we have turned a certain corner in terms of fundraising, although there are still some serious challenges to face. We have more ridings with more members, we're coming back slowly, but I have to tell you, the glass is, yes, it's, it's, it's one-third full, but it's still two-thirds empty. And there are serious issues with respect to the organization of the party. And as interim leader, there's not a whole lot, you know, there's some things one can do as interim leader to affect more of these changes, but there are things that have to be done. And I have tried as interim leader to take a really hands-on interest in what the heck is happening to the party. And I really believe that the party leadership has to be absolutely, in, you know, just dedicated to understanding what is happening in our writings, what is happening in, in, in across all of our provincial and territorial associations? Where is the money going? How are we doing? How are we actually building this party brick by brick, member by member, association by association? This is no time when we can afford to have for a moment a kind of an absentee leadership that says, no, we're not going to be absolutely hands-on as to how this works. I'll tell you, I was quite surprised when I met with Alf Apps after, after I became the interim leader, and I met with him at 81 Metcalf Street, and Alf said to me, you mean you're going to come down to 81 Metcalf Street and you're going to sit? I said, absolutely, why not? I mean, you do that all the time. He said to me, you're the first leader that I've spoken to and sat with in the office of 81 Metcalf Street. I said, that's ridiculous. And, and, you know, folks, we've really got to roll up our sleeves and get our hands dirty and understand what this is all about. Organizationally, it can be done, but if some of these reporters say to me, well, where's your biggest challenge? Is it Quebec or the West or way in the West? I say, it's everywhere. It's deep and it's real. But it's not hopeless. It absolutely is not hopeless. And, and I do not believe that if I describe the situation in the party as Serious, I am not saying that the, that the situation is past redemption or past hope. And I don't mean that in any revivalist or religious sense. Because as I said at the beginning, we don't know where in history we are exactly, or how this whole movie will turn out. We don't know. But what we do know is that nothing is inevitable. So that's the perspiration part. When it comes to organization, we have a job to do. And every liberal, you know, how many, how many people in this room say, well, you know, I'm not really interested in knocking on doors from the membership. I, I want to talk about policy. <laughs> you know, I'm more of a policy guy. And boy, we ever have a whole lot of policy people. <laughs> so people say, well, I'm really interested in I want to talk about industrial policy. Well, you know, I do too. And I don't mean any disrespect to, to the inspiration side of the party, because the inspiration side is just as important as the perspiration side. But let me tell you something. The perspiration side is really important. I need people who are going to give money every, every month, every paycheck. You know, and I need people who are going to be there giving money all the time to their riding association and to the central party. And I need, people, I need people who are going to understand that the, the days when you can say, oh, the problem is all in Ottawa. I don't want to give my money to Ottawa. I just want to give my money to the riding association. Or somebody says, I just, my riding is hopeless. I just want to give my money. No, folks, 
We can't get into this. We can't get into this useless, truly useless attitude that says, well, you know, it's, it's all about St. Mary Street, or it's all about Metcalf Street, or somebody else's problem. It's, there, is, there is no them out there. We're too small to have a whole bunch of them. <laughs> all we have is us. Us, us, us. But what is us? And a number of you have said to me tonight, you know, I, I hope you're going to, basically what you're saying to me is, I hope you're going to tell me what I think. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, well, people ask me, what do we think as liberals? And I said, well, I, you know, I, 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 think, it's, I think it's pretty straightforward. But let me, let me tell you something about what I, what I think it means. And what, what, is the, what is the inspiration that goes with the perspiration? It starts, in Canada, it starts with two or three central ideas that are worth repeating because they're not just truisms. They've been hard fought and hard won. The first one is that we care about freedom. The Liberal Party cares about freedom. And we care about individual dignity. And we care about the dignity of difference. And the liberal idea, going back to the days of the Reformation and the Renaissance, is all about the individual. It's about the, the transformation that's taken place in Western society since the 16th or 17th century, where people realize that it's about the liberation of, of each and every one of us, the, the realization that the world has to explain itself to us, and that we don't accept conformist truths. And all around Western Europe, there are monuments to people who've been burned at the stake because they didn't accept conformist or orthodox truths, and they were liberals. They might not have described themselves as such, they thought they were dissenters, or they thought they were non-conformists, or whatever. But there are people who believed in the value of freedom. And those same people would be shocked to hear that their descendants today in Canada are people who believe that whatever your gender or gender identity or sexual identity or sexual orientation, we want everyone to feel that they can be themselves and be proud. In my own life, I think the biggest transformation that we've seen has been this attitude to sexual orientation. And it's not a trivial issue. It's not a minority issue. It's an issue about how do we really feel about personal freedom and personal autonomy and personal identity. Because if you believe the story that Abraham stood and said to the skies, Lord, here I am. Imagine for a moment if you don't know who I is. Imagine for a moment if you're not sure who you are or what you are. And imagine for a moment if you're facing bullying and discrimination and hatred and opprobrium because you're not sure who you are. So when my premier stands up and says in the province of Ontario, we're going to allow kids who are 14 and 15 and 16 to help get themselves through who they are and how they are, well then I'm proud to be a liberal. I know who I am. <laughs> that, that stance of the Premier stands for so much. I'm not sure we all appreciate how courageous and how straightforward our Premier is being. And I knew the Premier's dad. And I know where the Premier comes from. And so for our Premier to do this and to stand for this is huge. And it is, yes, it is about being a liberal. We're also not only about individuals, we're also about a country. 
and going back to the origins of our party and going back to the history of our party and what we're about as a party, by God, we're about Canada. Our leadership has been so clear on this issue that we are about a country that believes in itself and that does not think of itself as a colony and does not think of itself as being dependent on anybody else and does not think it needs to be sycophantic and expressing itself in the world. And there have been so many moments in our history when this is what we have stood for as liberals. I mean, the little battles that were fought by Laurier in terms of saying when, he, when, the, when the imperialists said, oh, you know, it would be wonderful if you just went to London and you just became part of the British Empire and you could all be send your delegates to, the, to Westminster and you could be part of this great imperial adventure. And Laurier said, I don't think so. I'm a Canadian. I'm not going to get carried away by that. No, we're not going to do that. Well, he became Sir Wilfred. He was happy to do that. But, you know, that's part of it. Not ready. Mackenzie King has been much, much criticized and made fun of. Mackenzie King understood that the slow, steady extension of Canadian sovereignty in the world is where we needed to be. That's how we needed to grow. And we struggled for our, our identity in the First World War, and we struggled for it in the Second World War, and at the end of each war we came out and said, we are going to take our place in the world. And now you have the leader of the brain trust of the Conservative Party, Larry Miller, the member from Great Bruce, saying it's time we left the United Nations. Well, that's the heart of the Reform Party. That's, that's stop the world, I want to get off. That's a mentality that we don't have anything to do with as liberals. We're proud of who we are. Think of the role that Mr. Pearson played in building up our foreign policy and expanding and taking our role at the United Nations and saying to the British, sorry guys, imperialism is over, Suez is not going to work. The most painful conversations he could ever have had with people that he worked with and, 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 and was a colleague with and just saying, what were you thinking? <coughs> Why would you think you could get away with this? And coming to a conclusion, think of Mr. Kretschmer. When all of the people in the Defense Department were saying to their colleagues in the Pentagon, don't worry, we know. Canada will be there in Iraq. Well, you know what? They didn't know Mr. Kretchen. Because if they'd known Mr. Kretchen, they would have known that there was absolutely no way that he was going to authorize Canadian participation in an invasion of Iraq that did not have the full and fulsome support of the United Nations. And if that wasn't there, if the Security Council wasn't going to be there, Mr. Kretchen was quite simply not going to be there. No matter what the pressure. And, you know, I can tell you, I was in private life at the time, and Arlene and I were in Florida, and we had people who were apologizing, apologizing to their American hosts for the fact that Mr. Kretchen had not sent the troops to Iraq. And I can tell you, I was appalled by that. And I said, are you kidding me? Canadians understand this was not where Canada needed to be. This is not where the Liberal Party wants to be. And this is not where the Liberal Party is going to be, as long as I have anything to say about it in the future of this country. That's not where we belong. That's not who we are. And so, if you look at the economy, and there's a lot of preoccupation and worry about the New Democratic Party. But let me tell you what the central weakness of the NDP is today. There are a couple. I think there are two or three that we need to think through. We know what's wrong with Harper. That's, that's like shooting fish in a barrel with his eyes. <laughs> but let's talk about the New Democrats and let's understand what the problem is. The first one is that the economic theory behind the NDP 
is a theory that says, let's assume we have a lot of wealth. How are we going to divide it up? And I'm sure you all know the story of the economist who's on the desert island. And they have no food. And they have nothing. And they're starving. And so there people are sitting around, a lawyer, a doctor, an economist, and finally they get to the economist, what are you going to do? And the economist says, let's assume we have a soup can. If you don't have a soup can, you've got a problem. And that's the problem we have with the NDP. We cannot take wealth in Canada for granted. We might think we can, but we can't. We can't assume. <clears throat> We're learning this to our great challenge in Ontario. We're learning the extent to which we have to figure out how to earn our way in the world. And it's a difficult world. And it's not an easy world. And trade alone, as important as trade is, trade alone won't do it. I know there was, you know, we all think back and look at the great battle between Mr. Sharp and Mr. Gordon with respect to economic policy and how we were going to go forward as a country. The reality is we need a bit of both. Yes, we need to be aggressive on trade. We need to be aggressive on innovation. We need to be aggressive on manufacturing. We need to be aggressive on how we're going to build an economy in the future. And I know there's been some talk, of course, about, well, what does Bob Ray know about that? He brought the economy to its knees in Ontario. And in this audience, the very distinguished liberals, many of whom were profoundly skeptical and worried and even can remember where exactly they were when they realized that there was not going to be a liberal government on the night of September the 6th, 1990. Let me just remind you of a couple of things. Yes, we went through a difficult recession. But the fact of the matter, there are two facts that I want to just share with you that need to be understood. The first one is that over a five-year period, the NDP government raised spending by a grand total of 18%. Less than 4% per year. In one year, we actually reduced spending year over year. The first government in history to have spent less on health care in one year, 93, than we did in 92. So when you want to trace the causes for the defeat in 95, it was not because we spent too much. It's because we were too tough. I know that's not the contemporary wisdom, but let me tell you, Ray Days was not about giving people more money. Ray Days was about insisting that the public sector had to take less. And the second thing is to remember is that there are plants and communities and factories that are at work today and still working today that are there because we took a very effective public service under Mr. Davis and Mr. Peterson, and we put them to work at helping us to reconstruct the economic base of Ontario. We did it. We did it. I can give you an example. I can tell you what I was at the 20th anniversary of the Bombardier plant at De Havilland. The De Havilland plant was being sold by Boeing. Boeing was gone. Boeing told me, they came in to see me, they said, Premier, this plant will never work. The industrial relations are terrible. You can't make planes this way. It isn't going to work. I said, well, we're going to have to figure out how to work. We've got 3,000 people working here. We can't simply abandon them. We're going to have to figure out how to make it happen. And after a whole series of negotiations, we got Bombardier in. Ontario put in 49%. Michael Wilson said, you're crazy to be investing your money in this plant. I said, no, we're going to do it. We're going to make it happen. And we did the same thing in Thunder Bay. And in each case, the factories were totally renovated. We've got a world, world product mandate for what we were making in each of those places. And we've created a manufacturing base that is even stronger today, 4,000 people working today instead of 3,000. And I, I think, honestly, I think David Peterson would have done exactly the same thing. I think Bill Davis would have done exactly the same thing. I'm not sure Mike Harris would have done exactly the same thing. <laughs> but I can tell you, out of that tradition, of effective intervention in the affairs of the province in order to save jobs and get people back to work, I think it was, I think it was effective and it made a difference. 
And we need to understand some of the challenges. The answer is not the NDP attacking the West. It's not attacking resource production. It's not attacking what's going on. NDP has this notion that somehow you can build a great society on the basis of resentment. And you cannot build a great country on the basis of resentment. Yes, we are a resource-rich country. And yes, much of the economic oomph over the last few years has come from Western Canada. That's true. And we can't go back and pretend that we can recreate the days of 1950 and 1960 in terms of how the country runs. We can't do that. But we, what we do have to do is understand that there is still a powerful role for the federal government in providing leadership and that there is still a powerful role for bringing the federal government, the provinces, and yes, the municipalities together to build a better country. One of my favorite moments, one of my favorite moments over the last while, one of my favorite moments over the last while has been Stephen Harper going to Europe the last week and lecturing the Europeans on the subject of fiscal integration. Mr. Harper has not met with the premiers of this country once since he became prime minister. It's a world record. Europeans are getting together all the time because they have to, because of the situation that we're in. And they're having to constantly get together and try to say, how are we going to create greater degrees of integration? Why don't, how, do we do business, how does Mr. Harper do business in Canada? He dumps responsibilities onto the province. He takes great pride in the fact, they said, oh, we're, we've got lower taxes in, the federal, in, in Canada for the federal government. The lowest taxes since 1964. Who do you think is filling the gap? Who do you think is making up for the absence of the federal government? The provinces are. The provinces are now collecting more than half the taxes in the country. And they're stuck. And yes, Ontario's got its debt issues. And Quebec has its, has its deficit and debt issues. And Manitoba has its deficit and debt issues. And maybe the world markets won't be looking too hard at Canada and what's underneath what's happening federally. But I can tell you, the Federation is not working as well as it needs to. And just as Laurier was dedicated to bringing the Federation back in 1896, just to give you a, a date and an example, we've got to do exactly the same thing. What Mr. Martin did with the municipalities in making them true partners economic and social partners in the Federation. We have to, as Liberals, restore the health of the Federation the way Mr. Pearson did, the way, yes, Mr. Trudeau did, the way Mr. Cretchen did. That's what we have to do as Liberals in the future in terms of providing those security. So, to me, I have no difficulty defining what the inspiration for being a Liberal is. We know from our own experience that as important as freedom is, it also only happens when people have the means to truly realize who they are. When they truly have the support of the people who are going to help them become what they can become. And this is not some novel insight. This has been the spirit of liberalism for the entire 20th century. For the entire 20th century, we have, we have been about saying equality and opportunity only mean something if people can actually realize their potential. And it requires the community, whether it's the municipality or the provincial government, the federal government, whatever it is, it's only when people get together and start to invest in things that help people to grow and help communities to build and to sustain and help people that we get to where we want to be. Jim Flaherty and Stephen Harper are like the classic examples of the guy who was born on third base and think that they hit a triple. <laughs> We're all standing on the shoulders of other people in order to achieve our ambitions. 
And Roy and Lee are here tonight. I think of Roy's writing where I spent a lot of time over the last over the last few years in Etobicoke North. And the Etobicoke North of today is not the Etobicoke North of 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. You've got a huge Somali community. You've got an enormously you know, complicated and, and diverse community from all backgrounds. You've got more, you've got as many mosques in Etobicoke North as you have churches today. We have a diverse, diverse community. And you have to ask yourself the question, how are those folks going to realize their potential? How are we going to help those kids do well if they're going to school hungry? If they're going to school and they haven't been fed properly? If their parents haven't got a job? If they're living in ghettos? If they haven't got an opportunity to succeed? How are they going to succeed? And think for a moment, as Paul Martin would want us to do, think about the condition in our Aboriginal communities, both on reserve and in the cities. Think of the transformative effect that this is having on our country, on our western cities. And ask yourself the question, how are we going to respond to that? So we don't respond to it as liberals the same way you Democrats would respond. We don't respond to it by simply saying, well, the answer is to sort of pour more money in. And the answer is for the government to get bigger and bigger and bigger. The answer, no, the answer is for us to have the courage to identify a problem and then begin to say, how are we together going to address this question? How can we engage the business community in helping us to solve these problems? How can we engage our school boards to helping us to identify these issues? How can we have the courage to go beyond the nostrums and the truisms of the past to say, how are we actually going to make life better? Provide more opportunity. It, it requires a vision of the country. It requires an ability to say there's something in Canada that's bigger than the sum of our parts. It requires a vision that says, you know, we, we don't, we're not going to go, we're not going to, socialism <coughs> isn't the answer. I mean, in fact, I don't think there's a single question to which socialism is the answer. And I don't think the New Democratic Party can provide the people with the practical, knowledgeable, opportunities to create a future. And finally, and I just want to end on this point, the New Democratic Party policy on Quebec is completely and utterly hopeless. If the people of Canada knew what the New Democratic Party policy of Quebec was, they would never be supporting it. Because they, the New Democratic Party says this, they said, okay, we'll let, the, we'll let a separatist government decide what the question will be in a referendum. We'll let the separatist government run the referendum based on whatever question they decide to ask. And then once they go through that referendum, if they get 50% plus one based on their counting, that's the end of the country. That's their position. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not, this is not a cartoon. I'm not you know, engaging in ideological attack, I'm actually describing what is the end result of the Sherbrooke Resolution. I don't think anybody in Quebec, I mean a lot of people in Quebec, I don't think Federalists in Quebec, I don't believe that people around the rest of the country would say, yes, that's a good solution. It runs completely contrary to what the Supreme Court of Canada has said. And yet, you know, we went through an entire election campaign in the last election, and people were allowed to carry on the solution, as if this was the sensible and basic policy. And we have to be the ones, liberals have to be the ones to say, no, this is not the way to run a country. This is not the way to keep this country together. This is not how we're going to do it. We're going to do it in a different way. We're going to do it by understanding that you don't break up a country easily. You don't destroy a federation quickly. You don't give all the tools to the people who want to break up the country and say, well, I guess that's okay. And you don't pander to a nationalism whose appetite is frankly insatiable. You stand up to it and say, no. That's not the way it's going to work. 
We don't think that's the way the majority of your people in Quebec think it should work, and it certainly isn't the way the rest of the country thinks it should work. So I have no difficulty saying to liberals, you say, well, what do you stand for in the country? We believe in opportunity, we believe in equality, we believe in a strong role for government, we believe the federal government has a role to play in the future of our country, we believe in a federalism where we work cooperatively, but where the federal government is bringing people together, and we believe in a politics where you do not try to shut people down and shut people out and shut people up, which is where Harper's coming from, and what he stands for, and what he believes in, and how he operates. And the Reform Party has carried out a reverse takeover of the Progressive Conservative Party and turned it into something that it never was and never wanted to be. And if we let these guys carry out a reverse takeover of the entire country because we're not prepared to fight and fight hard and fight back and fight in a determined way, well then we've given up. And we have no business giving up. We have no business giving up on what we believe in and what we know to be true about this country. And the mistakes that we may have made in the past and the, the bickering that we allowed to happen inside our family, and the way in which we, we thought we could just carry on and that we were somehow, you know, we could get a majority, whatever happened. Those mistakes are in the past and are done. And if you let someone else define you and define your future and define who you are, well then shame on you. And we can't let that happen. We can't let the pundits, we can't let the, the Reform Party, the Conservative Party, we can't let all of the people who are feeding this terrible, angry, negative machine, we can't let that determine what happens to this country. And that's where we have to be as liberals. And so after a year as your interim leader, there's still work to be done. And there's still work that has to happen. But frankly, it's worth it. It's worth the effort. And it's worth the fight. And it's not going to happen without a fight. If we think that we're going to, this is going to be pleasant, or easy, or that something's going to fall into our laps, or that somehow there's some kind of magic genie that's going to solve this problem, well, i got news for you. I don't see it. It's going to take a lot of work and a lot of focused, tough, reasoned effort. And we're going to have to show the same kind of discipline and guts and determination as we have been able to show at the toughest moments in our past, but we're certainly going to have to be worthy of it now and in the years ahead. Thank you very much.